Good everybody, welcome. This is Paul Finn with GhettoFilms.org for the 1st of October 2015. Just want to do a really quick vlog. It's a bit late at night here, but just want to do a quick video on the Church of Scotland minister, so-called minister, Scott McKenna, who denies Christ died for sins. He says it's a ghastly theology. Now, for those of you not aware, the Church of Scotland goes back to the Reformation. It was originally Presbyterian. I'm not sure if it claims to hold to the Westminster Standards anymore, but it certainly doesn't in large amounts now. Um, back in the early 1800s, the Free Church of Scotland split from the Church of Scotland. And recently, I think there, there was another split from the Free Church of Scotland, and we have the Free Church of Scotland continuing now. It's a very good denomination, a lot of good ministers up there, but the original Church of Scotland is has been drifting towards liberalism and going along wrong direction for a very, very long time. I just want to look at some of his comments here, and uh, this is from a sermon that he preached back in March, and I'm just going to comment on some of the things he says. Let us pray. Encircle us. Just over two weeks ago, I was a guest of the University of Edinburgh Humanist Society, part of a panel of four. The society was celebrating Darwin Day with an evening discussion. One of the questions which I faced concerned the death of Jesus. The student said, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? I thought Jesus' death was part of God's plan. I thought he had to die. With grace, I replied, no, 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 no. That's ghastly theology. Don't go there. You don't want to go there. Ghastly theology? Well, says an unbeliever, and this man is an unbeliever. There's no doubt about that. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 16 says, You shall know them by their fruits. Verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns? or figs of thistles, even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, whereby by their fruits you shall know them. We know, and the several scriptures, you can go anywhere in the scriptures, um, from the very sacrifice of the first animal after the fall of Adam and Eve. There is a blood sacrifice. Um, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Uh, in Matthew one twenty one, it says about Christ, He shall save His people from their sins. Isaiah 53, which is clearly pointing towards Christ. And you can give this chapter to any body who's somewhat honest and they'll realize it's talking about Jesus Christ, not realizing it, it was written 700 be years before Christ, uh, before his uh, death, burial, and resurrection, but, and it was pointing towards him, and it says of his death, he had to please the Lord to bruise him, literally crush him, and he put him to grief that he should make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Literally in Hebrew, to crush him. Uh, it says in verse 11, My righteous servants shall justify many. He was numbered with the transgressions, verse 12. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. 
Christ bore the sin of his people. John 17, Christ talks about and prays for the people God the Father has given to him. I, in verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and for all the mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. He prays for those people whom the Lord has given him, those chosen before the foundation of the world. And to deny this doctrine, you are a heretic, sir, Scott McKenna. You are not a Christian. You are an enemy of Christ. You are a wolf in sheep's clothing. It is no condemnation of the student that she thought this. She will find it in almost everywhere in church life in theology, liturgy, sermons, and hymns. In the 17th century hymn, O Sacred Head Sore Wounded, we sing the lines, Thy grief and bitter passion were all for sinners' gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. In Charles Wesley's magnificent hymn, And Can It Be, we sing, And Can It Be, that I... How can it be a magnificent hymn if you disagree with it completely and you believe it's ghastly? Alter contradiction and confusion. ...should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood. Died he for me who caused his pain for me who him to death pursued. Jesus' death is foundational for Christianity. And there is a widespread understanding that he died in our place. Jesus paid the price for our sins. In my view, this theology is an obstacle to evangelism in the 21st century. It's an obstacle to evangelism, an obstacle to the gospel going forth, the gospel of peace, the one that regenerates them by the Spirit of God. How, how exactly? The truth is an obstacle to the Word of God going forth? Did Jesus modify his message to the rich man? No, he called men to repent, to lay hold upon the substance of the covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ, to benefit from his death, to be brought into union and communion with Christ. It is an obstacle because it portrays God as a potentate who demands blood for offences he has suffered. Our sins have offended him, and he demands a blood sacrifice. Known as substitutionary atonement, because Jesus is our substitute, he dies the death we deserve. God's forgiveness is then applied to us. In this theology, Christ is an atoning sacrifice. And on account of Jesus' death, a propitiation or ransom for sin, God chooses to see us as righteous because the debt has been paid, his wrath has been satisfied. I'm almost embarrassed explaining this theology because it is well past its sell-by date, and in some sense is quite immoral. I do not mean... Immoral by what standard? Did not Paul say, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I am not ashamed of the gospel. He's ashamed of the gospel. To mock those of previous generations who believed it or those who believe it in our time and for whom it is a comfort. 
but it is a theological argument which no longer works. It is damaging the church. It is what a heretic. And this is the direction many churches are going by embracing free will. And you might say, oh, but these churches are, are Calvinistic and all this kind of stuff. No, they're not. No, they're not. They may claim to, to hold to various creeds and whatever, but they do not. They barely know what's inside them. You shall know them by their fruits, not what they claim to believe, not what they, what they claim to hold to. They don't believe the Bible. And this didn't happen today, folks. This happened a long time ago. Heretics become more emboldened, more hardened in their hearts. And this man hates the true gospel, hates the true God, and needs to be removed from his pulpit. And if the people in his church have no problem with him, then they know not God or the true, or they, they know not the gospel. It has become a synagogue of Satan. It is so degenerated to no longer be a church of Christ. May God bless you all. Talk to you at the radio show at the weekend.